So you learned about this when you went to hear Julian Bond speak, but was your first reaction what mine was when I saw this, which is, really, nobody's done this before? Uh, no, because I know doing historical films that usually, no, you know, I don't choose a topic that had been done before, but as Pat said, 12 years ago this summer, I went to hear him and um, Rabbi David Saperstein, who's right now our ambassador for religion in the State Department, and the topic was blacks and Jews, and I thought I was hearing a talk about the civil rights era. Um, and sure enough, Julian Bond, as you can see in the film, his father, his uncle had been uh, funded by Rosenwald, and he knew very much the legacy coming up from the South. So I, I was just like at the edge of my seat, and a light bulb went off, just like in my previous films, that this had to be my fourth film. And it's also the third film about the American Jewish experience, but really about all us, you know, American history. Uh, he was a philanthropist of a different mold from what we see nowadays. You think of Andrew Carnegie and his libraries and those have endured, and the Rosenwald schools, some being restored and certainly the legacy is still here. What made him so different if you compare it to philanthropists nowadays? Well, uh, several things. I think one is the fact that he grew up quite humbly, um, and I think also very much influenced by living across the street from Lincoln. As a matter of fact, when I went to make my trek to Springfield, I called the Park Service and I said, you know, I know you're oversee um, the Lincoln House, and my understanding is Julius Rosenwald grew up across the street, and they said, well, we don't know where that is. So I come, I'm having a meeting in the Park Service meeting, and all of a sudden the, uh, the Park Ranger says to me, you know, by the way, we realize the building we, are, we use every day is actually the old Julius Rosenwald house. Wow. So that's all about history. You know, it's a, a, over 100 years ago. So I think he had this feeling from Lincoln, a, a sense of history. But I still say so much of it was what he learned from his rabbi, Emil Hirsch, this rabbi who taught very much about repairing the world, who himself had been from Luxembourg, had gone to the University of Pennsylvania, this will all be on the DVD, had played football. And when he came to run that congregation, that reformed synagogue, it was on Sundays. Things were different than uh, a lot of German Jews when they came to America. Reformed Judaism was practiced less religiously for lack of a better word, but also people worked on Saturday, and people of all den denominations would hear them. And the greatest <laughs> Rabbi Hirsch story is, apparently that something really bad had happened at one of um, the meatpacking uh, industries, and he called the guy out on it. He picked up, took his wife, and walked out of synagogue. I would have loved to have been there that day. And my line is, I don't see that kind of religious leadership today, except for maybe the new pope. How? <laughs> How difficult was, <laughs> he's got fans, Yeah. <laughs> um, how difficult was the detective work? Did, did you start at the Rosenwald schools and then work forward, or did you start in the present day and work backward? Well, I'm very lucky. I always decide to do a film, and it just happens a book has been written. With um, Partisans of Vilna, there had been a book written about the Vilna ghetto in woods. With Hank Greenberg, Ira Burkow had edited a book that Hank had just finished. Uh, with Molly Goldberg, there was a young scholar in the South who had just written a book on her. Uh, on her. And with um, this uh, film, the grandson, Peter Askely, who you see a lot in the film, Stephanie Deutsch had just written a book, and Mary, I gotta learn how to pronounce her last name, Hofstetter, or, uh, had just written a book. And then, of course, um, I think Isabel Buchelson's book on the Great Migration taught me a lot about what that movement was. So oh, it's you, go to, yeah, you go to those books, and then, you know, the family had archives. Uh, but that's, you know, after 36 years in the business, I you become a detective, and you, you look at more footage and more footage. And I have to say, with this film, I'm using more feature film than I ever did before which um, I hope it worked for people here, but I know <laughs> recently I showed the film to someone who's actually a very respected journalist, and he goes out, I go out to lunch with him, and he says to me, you know, Aviva, I can't believe you found the footage of Julius Rosenwald's parents getting married. Oh, so, you mean the, the Gene Wilder moment? Yes. <laughs> And I thought, oh, well, yes, it's very interesting how I got that. Um, and, of course, who else could get Clint Eastwood and speaking? And in color, too. Was, yeah. Who else could get Clint Eastwood speaking Yiddish? 
<laughs> and by the way, if anyone knows Clint, I'm still waiting for the final permission. This is also part of this week. There's also some footage that, um, you know, securing footage, uh, including the footage we saw today. I was, f I'm not gonna mention which footage or which studio, but I was calling and calling for months. Finally, I got on the phone with someone who said, well, why do you want your footage and why do you want a good price? So I'm saying, uh, I've worked on this for 12 years. Uh, you know, I'm a struggling independent filmmaker. We sort of have most favorite nations because actually HBO and CBS came through with, you know, the interview with Gordon Parks and Dr. Quinn and, uh, and Rawhide Free. And I said, you know, it's really important. And she says, I don't know. And I started crying. Now, I didn't expect to cry. I didn't script to cry. But as my nieces will tell you, I'm an easy cry. And I haven't gotten a lot of sleep the last four months. So she softened a little. And I said, and yes, I'm going to have this screening at the Museum of Tolerance, which I did last Monday. She said, ah, I took my daughter there. She cried there. So I said, oh, you have a daughter. How old is she? Oh, she's going for a driver's test tomorrow. And I said, oh, good luck. And before I knew it, I got $100 uh, a second instead of a thousand a second so well done you um sometimes yeah, but tears do work you know there is crying in getting rights maybe not in baseball <laughs> but in getting rights uh, and it's also better to get forgiveness than permission perhaps right so. oh no i mean you you have to do that well uh, you 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 used a lot of feature films in there i think i recognize a clip from the spencer tracy movie fury am i right no. the, the mob scene no but why use the feature film okay. stuff so this is interesting um I feel, and are there any screen, I can't see you all out there, but I assume there's some screenwriters They're out the there. They're the wonderful people out there in okay. the dark. Well, I think you all, because I know I've also written a, uh, several scripts, is I think you do as much research as we do as, our, uh, as documentary filmmakers. And I think a lot of scripts really are based there. There was actually one film that was on the Great Migration, and I loved it. But they couldn't. They didn't have it digitalized. We couldn't get copies of it. It would have been more footage of people coming up, African Americans coming up. So uh, I always go to feature footage. I had with Hank Greenberg. I used Gregory Peck, not being able to check in the hotel in Gentleman's Agreement. So I decided, look, I, I've got to go for it. And then I'm thinking, peddlers. I love Dr. Uh, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. And sure enough, Hasia Diner, the scholar, says. And uh, the peddlers would go door to door, and then they would sell to immigrants, to African Americans, and Native Americans. And there it was, exactly in that order in the film. And I thought, you know, that's a bingo moment. <laughs> now, in terms of, besides bragging rights, having Sidney Poitier in the film, who of course, you know, was very famous at this institution, uh, I. Um, uh, Raisin in the Sun was written by Lorraine Hansberry, who died way too young, but she grew up in Chicago. And that film is really about Chicago and segregation. And her, her father was a big desegregation lawyer. So I knew it fit about how crowded conditions were, but it also fit in terms of the backstory of Lorraine. So I, it was a way of honoring her. As you went to people to interview them about the schools and the fund, were they grateful? Were they all over themselves to, to be eager to talk to you about this? Perhaps uh, no one had approached them on this uh, before. Some were very shy, but yes, they were very grateful. I have to admit, there are three people I did not interview. Gordon Parks, that's from the HBO, and we'll give him credit. Maya Angelou was from an earlier um, uh, interview she had given some years ago. And luckily, um, I used the backdrop of my house. My mother's an abstract expressionist painter. So luckily, her, the back of her, her, her house looked the same. But the day she said, it, the programs are like the lynching, and I knew that Julius Rosenwald had, it was great. And then Ossie Davis, you know, I respected him a lot as an actor, and I think it really gave the, the, the Marian Anderson story an extra point. But I didn't interview him also. But of course, we got permission to use the footage. 